I can't. I can't look at it. Greetings to Podcastville. This episode of Church of What's Happened Now is brought to you by Anchor. If you ever wanted to make a podcast like this one, but thought the process would be expensive and horrible, no need to worry. Anchor is the quickest and easiest way to make and distribute your own podcast. Just don't just download the app, record with your phone, and bam, publish. Best of all, it's completely free on the arm. So check it out and make your own podcast at anchor.fm slash church. That's anchor.fm slash church. This podcast is also brought to you by my favorite product in the whole fucking world, Tushy Bidet, a.k.a. HelloTushy.com. Listen, it's that time of the year when you look at your relatives and you're like, I wonder what my grandmother's asshole smells like <laughs> while she's making pasta or fucking lasagna. You got it, and she's eating shit the whole morning in front of you. And you're like, I wonder what my grandmother's asshole must smell like. Listen, you don't have to wonder no more because with Hello Tushy, you know it smells fucking good. <laughs> Hello Tushy is a portable bidet you install right in your own fucking bathroom. Do you understand me? No more stories, no more nothing. You could defeat that hemorrhoid juice. <laughs> you could kill that fucking, those barnacles. Have your wife shave your asshole like I did and then hit it with that fucking water every day. And your asshole will be tip-top magoo. In the winter, you rub a little fucking hand cream on the asshole. And it's fucking perfecto mundo. You understand me? Hello, Tushy also makes towels. And also, they come in different colors. But listen, seriously, how, for how many more fucking years can you give somebody a tie or a wallet or something that ain't going to do dick? You want to give somebody a gift because you want to change their life. Right or wrong, give them a fucking <laughs> bottle of bidet and make sure their asshole is tip-top magoo year-round with a good fucking attitude. Go to HelloTushy.com and use code CHURCH and get 10% off your order. Again, go HelloTushy.com and use the code CHURCH for 10% off your order. Kick this fucking mule, Lee. Yeah. It's a beautiful day to be alive. What's going on, you bad motherfuckers? It's Monday, bitches, and you made it. Who's better than you? AJ Benzuch. Wow. Lee Syatt. We had a great weekend. Everything was happy. I want to thank Steakums for sending us those 30 fucking boxes <laughs> of Steakums. I haven't had them yet, oh. but I'm ready for my asshole to explode <laughs> after that fucking bidet. And Ste- <laughs> Let me tell you something about Steakums. Like, Lee came back and he said he shit right away. You know why? Because when you eat a Steakum, it replenishes your system in the shock. It's like fucking drinking water out of Hudson fucking River. You're going to be sick for an hour or two. But let me tell you something. Your immune system... You could fuck a crack hole while they're shooting you with fucking with the flu bug while they're shooting fucking the bowl up your asshole and you'll cough, you'll fucking pee, and you'll be right back at work tomorrow in the morning. You know how there's like they sell combo packs at yeah. stores? That'd be a great combo pack. What's that? Steak comes in a tushy bidet. Sure. Forget about oh it. Oh my and by the way, I was thinking about it. If you have like a white elephant, like a secret Santa, that's a perfect gift for that. I would that would that would be you'd be Steakums? the talk of the office. Steakums, but I was talking Steakums. about tushy. Well, that, you they, 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 steakums, steakums with onion. You 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 fucking do them up with onions, nice a little garlic in the pan. Forget about it. <sighs> Two or three of them at a time. Of bread a hot fucking roll with crusty. fucking provolone. Forget about it. With some all right of French oh fries. Oh my you god. Put them in the oven. Shit. I would stand up at the sink and not even sit down and eat them. Just I mean, let the fucking juice fall in the sink. Oh my Forget god. About it. <laughs> I, I was telling these guys I I had them. I used to kill my mother. Yeah. Like my mother would cook me a Cuban meal. Right. Oh, I want to eat. I want to eat fucking steak. That must have killed her. Killed her. Oh she God. never liked that shit. Of course. And I went on those for like a year straight. Every night. It's tough. I'd take a shower. Every night? Every <clears throat> fucking night. <clears throat> while tough. I while I showered, the, the French fries would be getting cooked. <laughs> oh, my God. And then I'd come down with underwear and cook the steak in <laughs> underwear and sneakers on like it's a savage. You understand me? It's sacrilegious. And then I would eat and pick the fries. I wouldn't even put the fries in the dish. Oh. I would eat them right <clears throat> off the tin from the oven. Of course. You just put salt on them and pepper and let them cool down. By the time they're cooling down, the steakum is cooking, you blast it out and you eat two steakums. Yeah. And you know me. Yeah. You know me, dog. I'm Cuban. You give me white Wonder Bread. Wonder Bread. Fresh What's Wonder bread, bread. A little bit of toast on it. A little bit of butter. You put the steakum on there. With but warm the butter. But warm, warm butter. Warm with butter with the fucking uh, with, the, with the cheese 
You're yeah. brand new. Well, cheese on anything, you're fine. You're brand fucking yeah, new. Yeah, you can't. I, I was telling them I ate them for so long that I played basketball one day. <laughs> uh, and that was the week I was clogged up. Like, it, was, it was like I ate 50 ooh. Vicodins. Yeah. That yeah, type of yeah. clogged up when you fucking I've been in shit. I've been up, I went up my fingers and tried to get it out oh my years God, ago. And when you're sitting in the toilet, oh. you're, <clears throat> you're in fucking pain. <clears throat> and that's why I had those farts, that, that pre-fart before everything came Yeah, out. the cork. And let me tell you something, that whole bus was fucking <laughs> yelling and screaming. And then I farted again a half hour later, and yeah. they kept saying, he's changing flavors. <laughs> but when it was fucking crazy, it was when the cheerleaders were crying. There was a bunch of cheerleaders, like white chicks, that were just like, Ugh. The white <laughs> chicks would cry, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Italian chicks Yeah, no, like, they, get it, they get it, because their father does yeah, their, their whole life. Yeah, does it all their fucking life. My father used to fart in the frozen food section when we were shopping. He'd, he'd hang his ass over, like, the meat, the frozen food, and he'd fart, and he'd block us in. Oh, it was murder, but murder. he would laugh, so he, would, he loved it. I love it. I he love it when it. you fart and nobody knows it's you. One time he farted so bad at work that the person at work called the fire department and said it was a gas leak. That's and he the knew best. it was his fart. He That's laughed the best when yeah. you laugh your ass off. You champion, don't say nothing. Champion nobody. asshole. The best story in my entire family was my dad farted and made my cousin throw up. <laughs> And I was like ten, and it was a girl, and she can run in. She ran into the room. We we're playing video games. She's like, "Your dad farted," and she just threw up in the bathroom. <laughs> it was the best day of my life. So, where the fuck have you been since I last saw you? Where have I been? Well, I've been. Uh, you know, I, it's a good question. I haven't seen you. I'm going to be honest. It's got to be ten years. Ten years. Uh, you were just finishing up at A and E, maybe. What was the channel? I was at the, was at the E channel, but I stopped with E, e. in uh, 2000. So, you know what? I did a, I did mysteries and scandals at E for five, six years. Then I did high stakes poker on Game Show Network, which was a really good show for poker fans for five years. Everybody watched it. Uh, I was, I was Gabe, Gabe Kaplan was my co-host. I was his co-host because he knows poker, and that was a show that just took off. We had billboards in in Vegas, million dollar buy in games. It was hot shit when poker was at its zenith, you know, and um. That was great. And then the economy, you know, 2006, whatever that year was, when the whole, everything fucking fell out. And I fell out. Everything fell out. The, they, the, the, the network dropped the show. And then it was an odyssey. Then I just didn't know what to do. Um, and I ended up going, I had a book, I had an idea for a book. And I went to New York to live with my sister. All right. My sister bought the house we lived in as kids. So I went back with my wife and my kids to go to New York, because I was writing a book about the summer of 1974, about there was a summer where my father was a tough Sicilian. His brother was a doctor, but he had a gay son from New Jersey. And then his second son, who was 10, was showing the same signs of being gay also. So my father's brother called one night in the summer of 74. It was so vivid, I wrote a book about it. And I heard my uncle talking on the phone saying to my father, Al, you know, Gino is showing the same signs as Larry. He's showing he has brain damage. They called it brain damage in the 70s. Not, not he's gay, homosexual, brain damage. And my uncle begged my father, can you take Gino for the summer? You know, your house is loud. You got the music. You got the, you got the homemade wine. You play stickball, Playboy magazines everywhere. AJ, just bo toughen him up. Let's, let's get him out of there. And my father said, sure, we'll take him in. So for that summer, we took in my, my effeminate cousin, and we thought, we'll change him. We didn't know what the fuck we were doing. But what happened inevitably was that he changed us. My father saw that, okay, this isn't going to be what I thought it was. He's gay, and we got to adapt to him, and we got to protect him and nurture him and, and make him stronger. And it was a wonderful summer. And I wrote a book called 74 and Sunny, that came out in 2015, and um, it was a beautiful summer, and obviously my, my cousin grew up to be gay, he's married now, uh, living in New York, but that summer changed my life, but it was, a, it was a, an amazing time, because my father who, look, my father was the Sicilian Archie Bunker. I heard Spick, Nigger, I heard WAP, I mean, he didn't give a fuck, he, 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 he was against all flags, but when he saw my cousin that was obviously gay, he said, okay, I got to change. So one day, this is when everything changed. This is a scene out of a fucking movie, and it will be. I'm in the pool. My father goes, get out of the pool. I got to talk to you. I said, what's the matter? He goes, come here. Get out of the pool. And we go to the front of the house, and we lived on Long Island. Nice neighborhood. And on the sidewalk in front of the house, it said in, in chalk, 
go home queer. So some some kids wanted to, they were sending a message to my cousin. My father said, who did this? I said, I don't know. I said, it might be the Dugan brothers. There were three Irish kids down the street. I said, I saw them earlier. He says, I'm going to take a walk. So my father, who was an ex-undercover cop, he puts a fucking gun in his back waistband of his <laughs> dungaree shorts and he's holding me, my hand, I'm 12, my cousin, my cousin's 10. And we start walking to this house, to the Irish house. And my, father, my father says, point which house? I said, they live over there, Dad. He knocks on the door. Mr. Dugan is a banker. He comes down. Ah, oh, can I help you? Yeah, Mr. Dugan, I'm Al Benza. Oh, hi, what's the problem? Well, I think your sons wrote something on my sidewalk uh, that's not too nice. Well, I don't think uh, my sons would do that. Well, they wrote home, or go home queer, they wrote. Well, listen. Mr. Benson, maybe you ought to take this uh, someplace else because obviously, you know, you're wrong. My father punched through the screen door, knocked the guy down, opened the door, sat on top of him, put the gun to his head and said, I'll fucking blow your heads. I'll blow your brains out in front of your kids. Get your sons down here now. They're going to clean my fucking sidewalk. And the guy called his sons down. Did you do this? And they said, yeah, we did. They cleaned the sidewalk. And my father's watching, and as they're cleaning, he's going, you you want to go in the pool? You, you want some hamburgers? I'll, I'll put something on the grill. No, 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 we're okay. But I ended up being best friends with Danny Dugan for the next 10 years. It was a, my, my father was a lot like De Niro in, 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 in many of his movies. Just tough, didn't give a fuck. Anyhow, I took a lot of scenes from that summer and wrote a book. Book did well, great reviews, and it got optioned. And now we're close to getting a development deal to uh, to write the screenplay and make it into a film. So the point is, I was in Long Island to live with my sister to write the book, but for a year I couldn't get a deal. Uh, so I lived in New York, and I had no fucking money. This is six years ago. And I ended up driving a cab 12, 14 hours a day on Long Island. And then I had another job. I worked at Best Buy selling TVs. Now, get this, Joey. I'm at Best Buy selling TVs with the fucking blue shirt. Everybody's 22 years old. I'm 49. And, uh, you know, they, they, they have things, they have sh the movies on every TV. Around. As I'm selling TVs, they got Rocky Balboa playing because Rocky was had just come out on DVD. So the movie I'm in is playing. And people are seeing me in a movie with Stallone, and I'm selling them a fucking 55-inch TV. How did that feel? It was initially horrifying, and then I got a kick out of it, and I had fun with it. And I started putting those DVDs in every TV in the, in, in the store. As a matter of fact, I found other films I was in and put those <laughs> movies in the screen. And the, the management said, right, come on, knock it off. Um, no, it was very humbling, but it was, uh, it was something I had to go through. And the book sold. I got a nice advance. With that advance, I came back to L.A. And I was able to start my life again with my wife and kids. And, and, and I, start, I, I started producing a movie, which was a great four-year job. Produced a movie called So Be It. It's out in theaters now. It's a children's book. We turned it into a film. So everything happens for a reason. I mean, I, I, when, I'm, when I was driving a cab, I was driving a cab around the, the neighborhood I grew up in. But I was, I was writing down scenes in the book. It, I don't know. It all had to happen. As as horrifying as it felt to work 12, 14 hours and come home with $40, it had to happen. And it worked out for the better. Just going back home yeah. to that house. And I'm the guy who, who left Long Island. I left, I left my little town. I'm the guy that made it. I'm the guy that, oh, A.J. Benza, in my high school, there's nobody else in my high school that I mean, plenty of guys in my high school are success successful in different fields, but no one went to showbiz. So when they saw me, it was, you know, I know some people saw me and they didn't want me to see that they saw me. You know, that, that look like, um, I, don't want him to, I don't want him to know we saw him because this, this is really hurtful that he's here. But I did it, you know, and I'd steal, I'd steal toys for my little son. I'd steal little, uh, these things called uh, Skyland. These, these little toys that were really expensive at Best Buy. And I'd stuff them in my socks because <laughs> I couldn't afford to buy them. Um, I'm glad it happened. But the, the, the horrifying thing was I'm sleeping in the same bed I slept in as a kid. Now I'm with my son, who's two, in a single bed. My wife and my daughter are sleeping in another bedroom in a single bed. Talk about... 
that was insane to be back in your fucking bed from childhood after having been in movies and TV shows and you name it. That was really something else. I'm glad it happened. No, and, and it brought you back. It, yeah, it, it brought me back. back. It the brought me back. strength of going back. I tell people, if you ever confused, you're having a hard time, there's just a feeling you get where you know you can't move forward, that means you got to go back to basics. Yeah. Because it happened to me in 93. Mm. And as broke as I was, I, I finagled a, bank, a plane ticket back to Jersey, and I bumped, I, I told the guy to front me a thousand 10 milligram Valiums. I'd <laughs> see him in two days. That's and I called don't. my buddies yeah. in Jersey and said, I'm coming with Valium. Right. At least I had a couple a thousand right off the bat to right. get me started. Right. And when I came back a year later, I gave the guy the money. What happened? I lost your phone number. <laughs> ah! Oh, man, that, that was fucked up. You, you were a great guy. I was going to send people to go looking for you. Now I lost your phone number. <laughs> but I went back to, and I walked around the streets of where I grew up. I, would, I forced myself to walk. I did too. Walk, take that. And there was no ferry in those days. I took the bus right. to Port Authority, and I, and there was days I, I, I worked at a car dealership as a as a salesman on Fifty Seventh and Twelfth Avenue, all the oh, way down wow. there by Damasi Cadillac know, and yeah. all that. All the car dealerships. And yeah. I would go over there with just enough money to eat. But yeah, I would have to be in a ten, and I'd have to take the seven o'clock bus. Yeah, because my friend's dad drove yeah. the bus, and I would get on the. This is after doing time. Yeah, going, coming out. Doing something with my life, I ended up getting divorced. And it took me all the way down to square root. But walking in those streets for mm-hmm. nine months, yeah. even though I was doing blow nine days a week, right. Even, right. no matter what I was doing, I was toughening up and I went to Colorado and here I am. It was right. because of that yeah. little nine yeah. months that really put everything into. I went into a club, I saw Legazamo on stage, it put the process together. I had already started stand up. But I really didn't know what I was doing. I was walking right. around waiting for Johnny Carson to see me. I didn't you know, what, we, that's the mistake we make. Like, <coughs> yeah. We're waiting for the real big I thought guy somebody to see was us. seeing you, and nobody was seeing me. And I go, I got to put yeah. work into this. You oh, yeah. right, right. Now I get it. But there's something interesting that came up. You're 55. Yeah. When's your birthday? June 2nd. Oh, so you just turned 55. Well, I'm yeah, turning six 55 in February. February 28th. 19th. Okay. And it's real interesting because I want. Most of the people that listen to this show, the demographic is not our age. They're you know, younger. They're very young. Yeah. You know, Lee's 29, you know. 29. And, my my life know, didn't start at 30, we, I was it's, 31. It's funny when we watch TV, when we watch old films, and they, they don't have the cell phones. I know. And we're talking about it in front of Lee or whatever. You know, explain to these people, because people have no fucking idea. I told the story on Comedy Central. I had a bunch of rude off a joke I told mm. on this thing about a guy that I grew up with that was Martin the Fag. In <laughs> Spanish, he was Martiga Maricón. Maricón, sure. Everybody knew who he was. Sure. He was a hem, uh, uh, guy <laughs> that the same, sewed ha- the seamstress okay, yeah, he, for a big play in the right, city. Right, And this has got to be 74. Yeah. Yeah, 74. Because I'm, I'm, I was 73, 10. Mm-hmm. I went to see the Mets play the fucking Yankees. Right, remember? The Mets play the Reds in the World sure. Series with Pete, Pete Rose. Big time. Beat up Bud Harrelson. Bud Harrelson. And it was about two years after that that uh, he pulled the gun at my mother's bar, Mating and Maricón. Really? Because somebody called him Mating and Maricón out to his face. It was well known. He was gay, but just don't break his balls. Good for him. And every night he come, he would, his whole thing was he was a seamstress. Then he'd take the bus over to Jersey, take a shower, get an ounce of blow in 20s, <laughs> and take it to CBGBs and all those oh, clubs yeah, in the city. Oh, yeah, sure, man. But let me tell you something. I'd see him once a week, and he always had a black eye, a tooth missing. Got the shit beat out of him. Every man. night yeah. there was some drama. And yeah. I said on stage one night, you know, you should thank faggots like Martin. Because he was one of the originals. He took the beatings for you, motherfucker. That's a great line. It's very hard to explain to somebody like Lee how hard it was to be gay in 1975. Oh, my God. It was a very small Forget community. It. Forget it. But you didn't accept it. There was a time you couldn't have long hair in oh, neighborhoods no. where he came from. Of course from. not. Where I came from, when I, was, when I first moved from New York City yeah. to, from 88th Street to North Bergen, when I was 12, 10... It was no long hair. I had long hair. And it was hard. It was hard. Rough. And I had dark. And and I was. I'm Sicilian, so I had dark skin. I was called nigger a lot, a lot. I had fights because I was called nigger. Well, I, I know this isn't a looks thing, but a few weeks ago, Joey was telling a story about someone was cross country skiing in their neighborhood. <laughs> 
and that just wasn't allowed. And some guy was sitting there, and the you know, at the time, first of all, the mindset was this: and it snowed. It's 1983. It snowed two feet of snow. Right. In those days, it crippled the city. Yeah, we sure. couldn't gamble because there was no daily news. Right. The book only had action on two teams: Brown <laughs> and St. <laughs> Lucius of fucking Martyr. <laughs> and the Coke guy was out of service. Yeah, because he couldn't get out of his it's car. The worst. So for three days, we're scratching like monkeys. Right. And my friend in front of a bar window waiting right. for heaven to come right, down right, from right. the skies. Yeah, yeah. He's got like a mug of beer. <laughs> he's got ESPN on. He's losing. And I'm sitting next to him and he's by the bar window and he's looking out and there's not a car on the street. <laughs> the, the, the streets are ice. Everything is parked. Some cars haven't been moved. Three feet of snow on top. Right. And we're sitting there and he's in a half a mood. And all of a sudden he looks out and there's a fucking dude <laughs> cross country cross country in 1983. No one was and doing my that. My friend looks and he goes, "What the fuck?" They don't is do that? it now. No, he goes, "What the <laughs> fuck so is that?" Crazy. And he jumped out of his chair and he chased him <laughs> and he started beating the fuck out of him. Then we all kicked him one time, right? Exactly. We go back in. We we had a janitor in those days from the high school oh, that we would wait till he drunks. would get drunk. They were all drunks. We wait till he get drunk. My God, but he was epileptic. Yeah, so he would have pills on him. <laughs> We'd, we'd steal the epileptic pills nice. and we'd split them in half and we got fucked up. Anything. Now we're fucked up to the gills. Yeah, it's three yeah. in the morning and I'm seeing police lights on the wall. <laughs> and I go out and the dude we beat up is in the back of the car with a blanket on shaking. Oh, right? <laughs> I know, I know. It, it's, it, was, it was so tough, you know, to be gay. <laughs> Like it was so tough. Well, I was tough. I mean, I, look, I didn't know what it was. So it didn't bother. Didn't yeah, I, I just heard. So, okay, so so we when you guys were ten or eleven, thirteen, whatever the age was, what did you think of gay people? I, I, honest to God, I didn't, I, I, I didn't think about them I at all. At all. Um, my, I grew up with. I grew. My house was my mother. My aunt lived with us. My mother, my my not, the other aunt was two doors down, and her daughter. My two sisters lived with us. I grew up with all women, so I only heard my father came home at ten p.m., ate dinner, had two scotches, and went to bed. I heard female stories all day, but there was no gay. There were no gay stories. There was nothing like that to to kick around. But when my cousin showed up, you know, my father. There was a phrase my father would say um, when my uncle called and said, "I think Gino is uh, brain damaged." It was a very quiet night. It was like one o'clock in the morning, and and I, I'm looking out my bedroom door, and I saw my father go to my mother. Larry thinks Gino's Fanucchia, uh, and he grabbed his ear. He shook his ear, and I don't know what that was a thing they did back then, and I don't know what it meant. Why you grabbed an ear when someone was gay? <laughs> and I that, what I what I deduced is I because gays wore earrings back then. Guys, you know, fags wore earrings. Oh, you couldn't wear an earring right. in the neighborhood. No, so I think that's why they did the ear. I think that's why they did the ear. And I tell you, when 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 they when my uncle came with the son with his son, and we went on the boat, we went fishing. The ladies were so concerned, like, "How's everything? What happened? You know, is everything good?" And and my father was like, it hurt him. It hurt him that his brother's son was gay, and he said. My mother said, "Well, look, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world." My my father, I remember, he said, "It's fucking close. It's close." He got mad, like, you know, I'm a man. That's not something a father wants to go through. So this is many, many years ago. Now, if my son was gay, I would buy him the best makeup. I would make sure he had the best fucking clothes. It wouldn't bother me. I, 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 it really wouldn't bother me. I swear to God, my son's an athlete. He's a great athlete. I wouldn't bust his balls. I wouldn't go to bed at night and wring my hands. As I got older in life, I just want my kids to be happy. Now, being happy and being gay it, nowadays is easily achievable. But in the 70s, it was fucking impossible. Was You're going to get fucking killed. When I moved to Jersey, the toughest family in the neighborhood had a kid that was effeminate. And at that time, I knew. But let me tell you a funny story. You've we been, called him, you know, yeah. You've we, been to Cuba a couple of times. Oh, three times. I love Cuba it. Cuba has a very huge gay society. Sure. Very big prostitution society. Oh, I know. Just I, a, uh, I enjoyed it. Yeah, Cuban's a, a haven of debt. But the also society they have is this, and I've talked about it before, it's an Amaqua society. Amaqua? It's Santeria. I, d- I went. I and loved all. I could see the bracelets. Mingi was crazy. Then underneath, there's a thing that Amaqua, and they were the longshoremen of Cuba. Really? And they were the men of Cuba. 
They were the Sicilians of Cuba. They were so Sicilian, they couldn't eat pussy. Oh, then you're right about they that. They couldn't be yeah. in another room. They couldn't be in a room. If Lee was gay, I have to walk out of the room. Right. Nothing against Lee. And they're not yeah. going to say nothing it's not against positive. Lee. No, but they don't want to be around it. No, they don't want to be, be around it. Because of my Santeria roots, there's a lot of gay guys in the Santeria room. And there was one in particular, and that was about eight. <clears throat> and he was partners with my mother in some venture. Jesus Who the fuck Christ. knows? Good guy. Good yeah. guy. Still remember. But whenever he would see me, he would scare me. Yeah. And he would always, he wouldn't say sexual things to me because my mom was in the room. He would always say to walk ahead. And in some Spanish national, in some Spanish circles, that means I'm going to fuck you. Well, one day Juan oh, was there. Shit. Juan was abacua. Juan didn't play that shit at all. And if it came time to hug him, he would put his hand out and shake their hand. Yeah. It was embarrassing how Juan acted. But he never lashed out at him. In fact, he always spoke to him in my mother's bar. He was friends with Martin. When he heard that that guy say that to me, he pulled me aside one day. And he goes, don't ever let that motherfucker say that to you again. That yeah. motherfucker says that to you again. Right. You either knock him out or you kick him in the fucking balls. Right, right, tell him you're right. going to shoot him. I mean, it was, it was scary. Well, and then the situation came up that he said it. And I went off on him in front of my mother. And my mother got pissed. And But uh, it, my, was, it was such a touchy, it's very touchy. situation in those days. It's, and I see it now. Now today I have gay friends. Nothing. That I don't care. I, I don't at care at all about that it. That does not bother But me. I'll tell you, my brother-in-law is 70 years, 71 years old. He's been with me since I'm five years old. So he's like my father. And Spanish, Puerto Rican. Tough Queens guy, you know. And when his little son Jackie was growing up, you know, we were watching the cabaret and my sister put him, she put a little rouge on his cheeks, she put him in a little <coughs> she put him in a little black dress. It was funny. We just we were laughing around the house. My father dressed as Joel Gray from Cabaret and she made her son to look like like kind of like Liza Minnelli. He was like he was three. Well the foot my, my, my brother in law saw it. You would have you would have thought he saw him sucking cock. That's how fucking mad he got. You know, Spanish, Italian, the Latin, the Latin people, they don't, they, he, get that fucking dress off my son. I mean, his face got red. You know, you have, but you I'll know. tell you who are the worst. And, I'm, and if I ever get to meet him, I'm going to pull him aside and ask him why he put that in his pilot. Who? Oh. And that it was brilliant. The pilot's empire. Yeah, that's right. Okay, the pilot's oh. empire, there's a scene in the beginning. Where the kid comes down with a dress, I know, and shoes on. I remember in the fucking pilot. We went ballistic, and he picks him up and puts him in a, in a garbage, garbage can. can, and he puts the lid over it. So genius scene. Well, let me tell you something, guys. My first friend when I came from Cuba, my mom had a bar on the twenty seventh, and West End there, whatever that street is, right off the, on the west. Oh yeah, right up on the upper west side. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, a yeah. black bar. Right, right. It was numbers. My mother's yeah. partnership was numbers right. with the dude. But I would go in there, and I became friends, and, and I became friends with a little black kid. The kid was my goomba. Mm -hmm. We ran around. Yeah. And we went all the way, bought James Brown records. It's great. I love it. He took me to the projects, and I ate with his family. It's and great. There was sometimes my mom let me sleep over on Saturdays, and they picked me up on Sundays. And I still remember 1968 like it was yesterday. The father in that house going off about the brother-in-law was gay. Well, you know when I'm in this fucking motherfucking chat, I don't want no motherfucking no. gay nigga in my motherfucking house. No, I know. He would say shit, and I was five, and I was scared of yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would go home and ask my mom, Mom, my mom didn't really know the whole Cuban, uh, uh, she didn't know the American translation, so yeah. she'd so go to bed. <laughs> but it was all about their brother-in-law being gay, like the, the wife's brother. Mm -hmm. And I'm not thinking, we were there on a Saturday night, right. and he embarrassed the guy in front of us. And then he told the wife one time when I was there eating, I don't want him in here when I'm eating because he's going to ruin my motherfucking appetite. <laughs> no, no. Shit like that. And I, I, remember being, I still remember being five and going, wow. Yeah. His hatred for that man. And finally, years later, I figured out why the guy was fucking gay. Yeah. That was the biggest hate I ever saw in my life for a gay. Yeah. Was the black. And that's why years ago when they said, they're going to put gay players in the NBA. Oh, good forget luck. about it. No way. Good luck. Yeah. Gay players in the NFL, good luck. Well, they're in there. They're in they're there. They're in there, but they're, they're in, there. in the closet big because they know sure. that they're the first. Listen, that thing yeah. with Ricky Jackson, I heard it was about 
Somebody went upstairs and said, listen, we think Ricky goes on both sides of the yeah, fence. Right. They had to ship him out two days later. Ricky Everybody, Williams? Ricky, the guy from New Orleans. The, the running the, back, the weed, yeah, the yeah. weed, the weed, smoker, Williams. The weed Williams. smoker, yeah, yeah. He's got that vibe. I could see that. They said that when that was I, one. I, of, when I he was in New that. Orleans. I could see that. That was one of the rumors, and that they shipped him right down to yeah, Miami. I could see that. He seemed like someone who was just like, like he was a hippie. He just he was a hippie. Yeah, he yeah. was a sweetheart. He just guy. whoever, whatever soul yeah, he connects he with. He didn't give a fuck about money. Yeah, I could. He see had that. no use for money. He had, he's married now. And he's got a kid. But people still I say don't it was matter. a. I don't matter. I guarantee. You know what I guarantee? He got high one night and went home with a guy in a Gay for a day. Two beers and a yeah. shot, yeah. man. Are you I kidding guarantee me? he swamps bit with some guy or something. Listen, I got gay friend. I got a gay friend who tells me we we laugh. He says to me, "You know how many guys." Two beers and a shove, and they'll take a shot at the other team. <laughs> and he says to me, and I've seen, I, I know stories from him. He's He was with the Andy Warhol crew. He's got great stories about people we know now that uh, have experimented. But um, that happens a lot. That happens a lot in show business. My God. I, I, I'm not going to mention names, obviously, but my God, does that happen a lot. You know, uh, hey, hey, how do you feel? You know, like James Franco is a guy like that. A lot of guys go, I don't want to go through life uh, with one hand, one hand tied behind my back. You know, I'm not. Right nowadays, everything's about being gender fluid. And hey, you know, I'm not going to put down what this guy does. You know, hey, you know, actors are great like that. But uh, the American public, the the vast majority of the movie going public. Doesn't want to know that. They're not ready for that. I'm not ready for that. You can't tell a guy in, in Illinois, James Franco sucked a cock once to try. When I used to come home from my, my gossip rounds, I lived in the West Village. I lived in I lived in the gayest building. I was in the meatpacking district, Horatio in Washington. I mean, and I had three Yorkies, so people thought that I must have been, you know, playing on both sides. But I come home four o'clock in the morning. And I'd see all the transvestites there. And I went around a couple of nights with, remember Al B. Shaw? Come on. Yeah. So Al B. and I would drive. Al B., I loved Al B. because he uh, loved to fight know, night and day. day. And Al B. loved to fight. When we would go to nightclubs, if there was any shit, he would jump right off of me. And we'd fight guys. And one night, we'd drive around in his Range Rover. And he goes, uh, I'll drive you home. I was, all right. He goes, watch this. And my area was all trannies. And he stops the car with a bunch of trannies, and he he likes he he puts down his his, uh, his dark window, and he goes, uh, "Hey, babe, what's going on?" And this tranny goes, "Oh my God, I'll be sure. What the fuck? Oh my God!" Now five other trannies come, and he puts the window up, and we drive off, and they're running after us. <laughs> he he liked that. He liked having that kind of uh, that kind of relationship or that kind of fun. With the tranny crap. And when I get home from my rounds, there was a couple, there was one girl named Coco, <laughs> uh, who probably, I'd see her at the fucking uh, deli downstairs, putting makeup on in the mirror, right? And she would tell me, hey, man, hey, AJ, Mike Tyson was here tonight. Arsenio was here tonight. Eddie Murphy came tonight. They were up in, they were up in a limousine, stopping off seeing the girls. I'm like, you're full of shit. She goes, I ain't lying. And now you look back. I completely believe it. Eddie Murphy, come on, getting pulled off on Sunset, taking that tranny home. Mm -hmm. Arsenio Hall, can you can you sit that right down here and tell me unequivocally he's straight? You can't. Mike Tyson, I think he likes anything. Mike Tyson? No, no. I'm not saying no, 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 no. I love Mike. I just was with him last week. But I'm saying when you're that sexual, I think Mike is one of those guys that has taken a shot with everybody. I really think that. I think if a guy's in the room and Mike Tyson was fucked up on coke like he was getting, and some dude said, I'll suck your dick, Mike would let him. Uh, that's what See, I'm saying. Richard Pryor let like, guys suck his Richard, dick. Like, that's, that's the thing. That's when that's I said earlier, saying. I don't want to know who anyone's fucking. Like, this is, that's Richard crazy. Richard Pryor. That's a great I example. Mean, listen, I remember working on the best dance sports show, and oh a girl, one of the girls in wardrobe or something was black, and we became friends. Nothing... I'm not nothing like that. We're just on the set. <coughs> she was a, a fan of stand up. Yeah. And one night she was explaining to me about the whole Eddie Murphy thing. And 
guys, I was blown the fuck away. Well, look at his look at his wife. That's, his wife looks like a man. The, his ex wife Nicole. My, my my fucking film idol. Yeah, no, no kidding. Forty eight hours and, and trading, trading places. places. Come on. Now it wouldn't make a difference to me. I don't, I don't give exactly. A, I don't. It's care like either. I always knew Judas Priest singer was gay. I knew yeah. when I was fucking 19, 19 right. 17, I yeah. knew this guy jumped the fence. It didn't make a difference to me. Right. It never did. My mother didn't raise me at all. Yeah, I don't care the either. kids. I don't care. I'm just intrigued by it. I, I wasn't even intrigued by it. I just didn't. I was more blown away. Like when they said Eddie Murphy and then I, I, I remember going home that night and not saying a word and not like, I, I don't know what the fuck Eddie Murphy. I could, He sold it. Yeah, he but did. But then I yeah. saw him at the comedy store. And everything went away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, everything went away. Well, he was dressed who he was with. Right, I used to see what, yeah. And then I saw Banks, uh, Richard Pryor's old manager one mm. night, and he goes, Cuba, watch. Watch, Cuba. Me fuck, watch me fuck with these motherfuckers. There was Eddie Arsenio, the singer from Boston. Oh, yeah? What's the guy's name? I don't know his name. Come on. The singer from... I don't from, know the lead singer from who's Boston. Who's Bobby Brown? What band was Bobby fucking Brown in? First uh, edition. First uh, edition. First, uh, yeah. Who's in first edition? Get the five characters in first uh, edition. I can't think of their names. I know. Who's the I most know. the singer? The the black singer, really good looking. I can't Google black singer. No, Google Look up fucking. The, 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 no, um, there's a lot no, of them. New edition. Kenny, Kenny new, edition. Rogers? new edition. New edition. Singers. New edition. New edition singers. singers. Just new edition. Just the band. New edition. Bobby Brown, Johnny Gill. Gill. Johnny Gill. Gill. Okay. Big time. There you go. No doubt. It was Eddie Murphy. He lived in... He lived in, he lived in it was Eddie Murphy. It was Eddie's guest house. Johnny Gill, Arsenio Hall, yeah. and Paul Moody. Okay, they're sitting by the comedy store sign, and Banks walks up to me and Rogue and maybe somebody else, and he goes, hey, watch me fuck with these motherfuckers. <laughs> and he goes up and he goes, hey, what are you guys going to do? The Queen's a comedy tour. Like right to their faces. Wow. And they didn't say nothing to them. And as soon as uh, somebody, Johnny Gill walked away, Charlie Mur uh, Eddie Murphy, like, just nickel for him. Really? And he came over. Again, if you're listening to this, doesn't bother me at all. Yeah, I'm just letting you know the shit we see. Yeah, I see. Listen, that I, I, it's, it doesn't and, and, really Eddie, and, and Johnny Gill lived in Eddie's guest house for a while. And I'm a big fan of Eddie Murphy still. Love you know? him. Well, Love let me tell you, him. Eddie Murphy used to come in and tip my wife a yardstick for three waters. Really? That's great. Two yardsticks. A yard, any waitress who weighed on yeah. a yardstick. Oh, those guys are the best. And one night, my wife gave him two waters. He came in there with Johnny Gill. And my wife said I was walking to Pink Dot to the car. And I heard a car beep. And it was Eddie and Johnny Gill. They pulled over. And he goes, I, I forgot to give you this. That's Merry a stand-up fucking guy. And ever since then, I love Eddie Murphy. Yeah, that's great stuff. And that's the uh, the funny Terry thing. Will tell you, my wife will tell you. Yeah, my wife will tell you. It's the funny thing about the negative uh, responses you got to that story about uh, Martin, um, about Mar Martin. Because, yes, you said the word faggot, but it was a very positive story. No. And this is what happened. He did something... You know, I came from a macho society. I came yeah, from a Cuban too, yeah. macho society. Right. Not to mention, like I tell people, I grew up in North Bergen, New Jersey. Mm. This is really weird, and I I didn't know this for sure, but I always knew I thought a little fucking crazy. <laughs> I grew up in North Bergen, New Jersey. When I moved there, it was an Italian-Irish cesspool. Yeah, right, right. But it was Italians that had moved on up from Hoboken. Yeah. And then I watched the Sinatra documentary, how those Italians were not allowed because there were Italians and the Irish were fucking with them. Mm -hmm. They weren't allowed about above 9th Street in the 40s. Really? So these kids' parents that I was talking to, like, mm -hmm. I, like Ascalise, for example, I would go to the house in the summer and eat, and she would say, let me tell you, how much are you paying for that concert? 22 22 Let right. me tell you who I seen for $3 right. at St. Rocco. Right, exactly. I saw Sinatra. Sinatra. This guy. And I had that. money for Chinese and food. And we would yeah. talk like that. She would go listen to because she was from Union City, and she would go, I would go to those dances because I would talk to Sinatra, yeah. the mother, right, right. the whole fucking thing. <laughs> you know, was, everybody knew everybody I know. for $2. Yeah, so yeah. It's all those people from Hoboken moved to North Bergen. So I always tell people, I'm from North Bergen, but I got, when my mother died, who took me in? Sicilians from Hoboken. Mm -hmm. Who's, who's the baby's godfather? Right, from Hoboken. right, right. Who's uh, the, They're all from Hoboken. And we all, you know, like I tell people, I can't sing. I got one thing from Hoboken, balls. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> That's great. I came out here yeah, to yeah. swing. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, Like Sinatra, the I swing. Love it. And I love it. it's just really weird that people 
I, I always want people to understand, like, you got to stick up for yourself. Mm -hmm. And these two dudes said to him one day, they were drinking, they were both bookies. Mm -hmm. One guy's name was Anando, and his brother was Umberto. And they were, Umberto had a regular job, but Arnado was the bookmaker that belonged to the bar. Right. From 10 to 3 to 10 to 5, he right. sat at that stool. Yeah. From 10 to 3, he took numbers. At 3, the number took off, but if you wanted to give him action for the next day, he'd stay there till 5. That's but they get their drink on. And when right. they got their drink on, Martin was going into the city to sell Coke. He came in, because around the corner from my mom's bar was the last bus stop to take to New York City. It was in front of a post office yeah. coming out of Union City, New Jersey. Right. Mixed Weehawken, they call yeah, it. Yeah, I know Weehawken, sure. Right out of the tunnel. Right out, right of, the out of the tunnel. So Martin came in, and I was playing that stupid game. Remember that stupid game that it was bowling pins, and you had a metal puck, and it had yeah. sawdust, and yeah, you yeah, threw it yeah, in yeah, the of 70s? Course, of course. I'm playing this game, Lee. Yeah. This is unimaginable to you. No, I think another if game. You, it's like a shuffleboard It's like a shuffleboard type right, of thing. Of course. And I'm playing this game, but Martin's where you are, yeah. and the bookies are where he is. So he says, and there was like a minute of calmness. <laughs> And then Martin went on his back no. and pulled down like a 38. And he goes, oh, yeah, let me tell you something. Unless I sucked your dick or your <laughs> dick or you sucked my dick, then you call me Martin Maricon. Until then, you call me Martin. And my mom's yelling at Martin to put the gun down. Coco is right behind you because she knew Umberto packed. Yeah. Coco's right behind you. Don't get this shit off it's in the like bar you're gonna right get now. Hit. You're going to get Jose hit. Antonio. Better because that's my real name, Jose Antonio. Oh, yeah? So Jose Antonio, where did oh, I eat? Shit. I froze. I was right there. And he's like, nunca en tu vida. Me right. diga, I call me a faggot again. Me entiende? And then my mother said to him again, uh, Martin, Coco's there. And, she go, and he goes, Coco needs to see this. Oh, Don't ever call shit. me a faggot again. And my, and my mom started yelling at him, get the fuck out. You're not allowed in here again, Martin. I don't care how long I love you. Wow. Get the fuck out. He pulled the gun out, disappeared. I was in shock. They said something to each other. I never thought about it again. Three days later, there was a knock on my door. I opened it up. It was Martin. He mm. goes, I really apologize for taking the gun out front of you. My mom won't let me in the bar unless I apologize to you. I go, Martin, are you fucking kidding That's me? That's great. You're my personal Charles Bronson. <laughs> right. I fuck Charles Bronson. Awesome. You are the king. Yeah. What you did the other day in front of me. That is great. You blew every circuit yeah. in my mind. Now, when I was like six, I saw my stepdad beat up a guy in the Bronx for hitting a dog. <laughs> you know, Cubans, old Cubans. Today, in fact, today's St. Lazaro's birthday. Oh, December really? 17th. I stayed up last night and a little purple candle. Oh, nice. Yeah, you got, today's December 17th. Today's Don't Hit a Dog Day. Oh, that's great. Because in a year from now, you'll be in fucking crutches. Saying, oh, you'll have leprosy. That's awesome. So he hit a guy for that. That's big in Cuba, but I hit the dog. And then one the dogs time, are all over Cuba. And then one time in, in, uh, at a Santeria party, he shot a guy in the leg on 148th and Broadway. <laughs> and then we got in the car. He threw a gun. We, it was right. Broadway goes down into Riverside Drive in yeah. those days. When yeah. we went into Right by there, there was a park. I'll never forget. We ran up 147 because 148 was, came up town, uh -huh. came up the hill. Right. 147 went down. He parked right. on like 147th and Broadway. We made a right. We drove a couple blocks. He goes, wait right here. He took that the gun, he threw it to the Hudson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We drove home. He never said anything again. Never said anything again. So that I already already seen the yeah. real deal. Yeah. But what he did that afternoon at four in the afternoon, it's fucking great. It blew me away. That's so the I, best. I always loved the guy. Until I robbed him, lady. <laughs> you know, he was dealing tremendous cocaine. Hey, what are you gonna do? I had to take. What are you gonna do? You got to. But. And you no, still loved him. But. I loved him to death. But business is business, yeah. No, no, no. I fucked up as a kid. I fucked up. I was I stupid and greedy. Yeah, I and, uh, but I never... But it's funny that you said something because I have a video on YouTube that people are really getting pissed at me over the years. What happened? That I just miss said the words. Uh, what'd you say? When we were kids, we used to go to Boulevard East. Yeah. 16, 17, 18, we used to go to Boulevard East and mug dudes that were coming... That would get drunk in the city and yeah. would go over looking for the guy that sucked their dick. Uh, 
Oh, wow. I went on the street where guys would stand by Boulevard East, by Suicide Bridge. Really? If you wanted to get your dick sucked. <laughs> After a while, we just started hanging out there, and we'd make guys pull over, get out of the car, we'll suck your dick under the tree. Wow. And then we'd jump you. <clears throat> I said fag, but I shouldn't have said the word I know fag what you mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nine out of ten of those guys were guys that were probably married. Right. Just oh, of course they were. Sure, guy. sure. Yeah, I had a buddy who... Uh, it wasn't my scene. I wasn't. I didn't do coke as a kid. I didn't do coke till I did coke in college. After I got out of college, my father died when I was twenty-one, and when I got out of coke, one of my buddies came back from college and he had uh, coke and a tinfoil wrap. I said, "What? What is this? You got to try it's coke." I said, nah, I, "What year is this?" This is nineteen eighty. Uh, I was twenty-one, so I was born in sixty-two. Uh, you 80, know, 83, 81. 82, 81, 81, like that. 81. 81. And I said, nah. That's when it was still fucking delicious. No, it was great. I tried it. I said, look, my fucking throat closed up. My father just died. Remember, my father was an undercover narc agent. So I, I just, I had a bad feeling about it. My throat closed up. Naturally, an hour later, I loved it. And I loved it. And then I didn't do coke again. I just said, nah, I'm done. I got married young, my first wife. Uh, my bachelor party, of course, we did coke. I had a 1980s wedding, so forget about it. My my, my all my ushers had fucking loose. coke. They fucking had bloody noses. Please, I have the pictures with the white shirts with the red red spots. No coke again. And in like in 1990, I don't know, four, five, seven, six, 96, my nephew is in college and he goes, me and my buddy want to try cocaine. And I said, oh, you're not going to try it. I'm going to try it. No, you're going to do it with me. I don't want you going to some jerk off and get some bad. I'll, I'll get the stuff. I have. I know who to get it from, and I did it with them, and then I got hooked. I could. I didn't like in, the, in my twenties. I could just drop it and didn't care about it, but in my thirties, that's what's so fucked up about that drug. You don't know. In my thirties, I couldn't I couldn't get enough of it. So for a long time, it was like I did it constantly. Whenever I could, I had plenty of money, plenty of time. I wasn't. I was working like. Two days out of ten, I'd film a few shows, and then I was off forever. So it was easy. I was home, and uh, it's so weird. And then, then it became a problem for me. But, um, yeah, it's a fucking weird. But my buddy, he got so crazy with it that he would go try to cop some crack. And this is what he did. He told some guys who were driving around with crack, I want to see what you got. And he'd drive, with, he'd drive with the car, and he'd say, I want a cop. And they'd show him the crack in their hand, and he'd fucking hit them with a hammer. And the crack would fall. He'd grab the crack, and he drove off. So he did this like five or six times. He got a bunch of crack. The word got out. He got guys with welts on their head the size of golf balls. It was a small hammer, but fuck, you know, you go down. So that was his big ploy for a while, that, hitting the guys in the head with a hammer That's for crack. quite a ploy. But he, said he, got, he, he went to jail and got lit on fire. He's dead. <laughs> Fucking guy, Glenn, Glenn Edridge. He got lit on fucking fire. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Evil, oh, evil God. drug. Tony better, buddy. Oh, oh my God. I can't. I can't. I can't look at it. Greetings to Podcastville. This episode of the Church of What's Happened Now is brought to you by Anchor. If you ever wanted to make a podcast like this one, but thought the process would be expensive and horrible, no need to worry. Anchor is the quickest and easiest way to make and distribute your own podcast. Just don't just download the app, record with your phone, and bam, publish. Best of all, it's completely free on the arm. So check it out and make your own podcast at anchor.fm slash church. That's anchor.fm slash church. This podcast is also brought to you by my favorite product in the whole fucking world, Tushy Bidet, a.k.a. HelloTushy.com. Listen, it's that time of the year when you look at your relatives and you're like, I wonder what my grandmother's asshole smells like <laughs> while she's making pasta or fucking lasagna. You got it, and she's eating shit the whole morning in front of you. And you're like, I wonder what my grandmother's asshole must smell like. Listen, you don't have to wonder no more because with Hello Tushy, you know it smells fucking good. <laughs> Hello Tushy is a portable bidet you install right in your own fucking bathroom. Do you understand me? No more stories, no more nothing. 
You could defeat that hemorrhoid juice. <laughs> you could kill that fucking, those barnacles. Have your wife shave your asshole like I did and then hit it with that fucking water every day and your asshole will be tip-top magoo. In the winter, you rub a little fucking hand cream on the asshole and it's fucking perfecto mundo. You understand me? Hello, Tushi also makes towels and also they come in different colors. But listen, seriously, how, for how many more fucking years can you give somebody a tie or a wallet or something that ain't going to do dick? You want to give somebody a gift because you want to change their life, right or wrong? Give them a fucking <laughs> bottle of bidet and make sure their asshole is tip-top magoo year-round with a good fucking attitude. Go to hellotushy.com and use suckers. <laughs> you want dates? I ain't got no fucking dates, all right? That's how we're doing it. AJ Benz is still on here. <laughs> that is fucking hysterical. He yeah, fine. Yeah, his brother was my best friend. He was in that of the joint. Ronnie, Ronnie was the best. Ronnie, when I hear you, now I know you for years, but I just because I started my podcast six months ago. I'm into podcasts now, and I started listening to yours. And you sound just like the guys I grew up with, except you sound exactly like my buddy Ronnie Maselli. In and out of the joint, the funniest fucking guy in the world. We're friends since we're six years old. He's down in Florida now. Of course, where everybody goes when they got to fucking run away from shit. So like him, you like a lot of guys I grew up. My cousin Phil, who's a building inspector. You got all that stuff. So when I listen to you talk, I get so into it because I feel like I'm listening to my buddies. It's the best. I love it. Now, you went to college where? CW Post out in Long Island. To be a writer? I went for journalism, yeah. I came out, and um, I didn't want to go to fucking, you know, Ohio to be a reporter or Alabama. No, Normally, you got to leave New York to get into a newspaper job. I said, I'm not leaving. I can't leave. I can't. I could never leave my mother and father. And I, I got a part-time job at Newsday, which was a big newspaper in, on Long Island. Big. Like, top fucking five in the country. And I was doing high school and college sports. And that was nice. I go to games, write the fucking highlights. I enjoyed that. I like being around sports. And I wanted to be a full time writer. It wasn't happening. And then eventually, after like five, six years, one night, oh, this is great. I got divorced. <coughs> I got divorced. I had a little money. And I sold my house. And I said, I'm going to go to fucking New York. It was Vogue Magazine's 100th birthday party at the fucking some museum in Manhattan. And I didn't know anybody. I said, I'm going. I'm going. So I fucking go to New York. I try to get through. Everybody's there. Velvet ropes, you name it. Bob Wyatt. There was no way I was going to get in. And as I'm trying to get in, Mickey Rourke gets thrown out. And I love Mickey. Pope of Greenwich Village. I still have the tattoo. And my nickname is Pope for fucking 30 years because of that movie. So he he gets thrown out. And it was like, I couldn't make this up. He turns around and looks at me. And he goes, where are you going? I said, I, I don't know. I, I couldn't even speak to him. It was Mickey Rourke. He goes, get in the car. We're going to go downtown. Just like that. He didn't know me from Adam. I get in a black town car. His, his buddy's driving. He's got Bob Dylan on, knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Mickey's getting high. We're going downtown. We ended up at a place called Rex downtown. And he says, don't worry. In two hours, the whole fucking party's going to be here. Two hours later, Naomi Campbell, Cindy Crawford, Claudia Schiff. Yeah, every girl you can imagine walks in. They're all over Mickey. Mickey, this and that. And I saw shit that night. I saw Cindy Crawford making out with chicks. I saw girls putting their hands down Mickey's pants. Insanity. And I'm a guy who was just married for five years on Long Island, putting up fucking wallpaper with my wife going to Home Depot on the weekends. I was a regular guy. And I said, Jesus Christ. So the next day I called a gossip columnist at New York Newsday and I said, you know, I work at Newsday in the sports, but I said, I was out last night. You, I got a, a couple of tips for you. I saw, I told her what happened. She goes, wow. She says, uh, why don't you go out for me every few nights? I'll give you 50 bucks a night. Just bring stories back. I said, all right. So I started hitting Manhattan. I knew nobody. What year is this? This is 1991. I knew nobody. And I'd, I'd wait there by the velvet rope like an asshole. I'd wait there. And uh, I had a little bit of money. I was doing something. You remember the tout services where you caught gamblers would yeah. pay you? So Where'd I, you play for Mike Duffy? I knew Mike. No, I was with Stu Finer. Stu Finer. Stu, Stu raised me on that. I did Where that. Is Stu? Stu is in Long Island, still doing it on the internet. God bless him. You go to Instagram and look at Stu Funny. He's out of his fucking mind. Still. Love him. I just saw him not too long ago. I love the guy. He's a, he's an animal. He taught me 
And I, I worked for Major Wager, Profit Sloat? Line. Curtis who? Curtis Sloat. Yeah, I remember that name, but I didn't work for him, now. I yeah, remember that that's name. that's who I worked the for. The captain. I worked for Curtis. You did? In Colorado. Oh, wow. This is 91. Okay. So I worked for Curtis yeah. in Colorado, and Stu Finer would come out. And what had happened was that I worked for him for two football seasons. I was terrible. Mm. But they had to pay me the second season because their competitor, like one of their guys quit that they grew up with. Because all those guys had grown up together. I know. I tell that story all the time. Lee, they were Jewish. The Sloats. Him, his brother, and his mother did this in the basement by themselves. They taught, the me, how to sell. Season, they taught me how to close They made $700,000 yeah, in the no, basement. Yeah, no, no bullshit. The first football season ever. Yeah. The mother and the two sons did it in the basement. The guy, your guy, yeah, told them how to do it and send them leads. Stu... It's 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 amazing Listen, the business. The how much, how much did the guy get? Here's here's the way it works. The way it works is you get leads. You get, they, we used to get the list of names from casinos in Vegas or Atlantic City of guys who gambled, and then you cold call them, and you say how the game's treating you, whatever the fuck. You use a different name, and back then they could pay you through Western Union. Through Visa, Mastercard. Listen, grab the fucking card. I'm going two and zero. Exactly. Tonight. You're gonna sit there betting what two hundred a game like a mook that you are. I'm telling you. Hold on one second. Yeah, it's, I know, right? Yeah, oh, that's I it. I just did a line of fucking coke. Blown. I just got from the fucking <laughs> Colombian. So blown. Listen to me. I'm gonna go out tonight with this Chinese girl. She's gonna suck fucking my balls while she does a bump of These, coke. They love. And you're gonna sit in your little fucking apartment in the Bronx, yeah. fucking wishing that you won. Now, one of your bets is opposite mine. I know. Grab a fucking card. I know. I'm going two and zero. Forget about two. No, let's bang one in for 10 G's right now. As a matter of fact, put me on hold. Go in your mother's room. Get the fucking phone. Grab that phone and the call works. the book and see how much you can put in there. Right now. The I'll fucking hold right now. The way it works. Go ahead. I guarantee you, you won't be fucking sorry. What? I'm asking you for a measly 300. You miserable. I'm embarrassing sack. myself. You're You're embarrassing myself. I'll never forget one night because uh, the first season I did, he fired me because I was just doing blow. Yeah, everybody making, did blow I was there. Just making so Bacon, much egg, and money. cheese sandwiches, blow and beer. Blow. I, I was just making so much Three money. hours a night we were. I I, half my check was going to the attorney I know. for the divorce. Horrible. And the other half, I had the pork in on the arm. So he came to me and goes, listen, Chris, Kurt's going to do, uh, Stu's going to do the show on Friday nights. Come in. I want my guys to come in. I want you to come in. You can make a couple hundred just coming in on Friday nights from 6 to 12. Yeah. And I would go there, and the guy would stop by 11, drop the package off. It was great. So he let me go in January. He goes, Joey, I can't have you. You're at the <laughs> yeah. desk with a paper and you know. Now, you were, I, I, I wasn't doing, I, I was there. I did a few bumps here and there, but the there were guys season, who were insane. I did really well, and I quit because of the football season ending, you know. Football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Football was the big one. And then I moved to Seattle. And I bought a sports magazine. I go, he did it on his fucking desk. No, listen. Let me do it out of my house. Not, you did it alone? I did it, I did it too. I did it too. I called for one of their friends. But the phone bill gets higher. No, at that time, it was 1-800 was for free. Oh, okay. I cut a deal with 1-800 coming in was for free. And I would call you back. And let me tell you a really funny story. Fucking, I did it and I called one of Kurt's friends. And as I was talking to him, I knew Kurt telling me a story about this Greek guy. And he goes, what do you want to do? I go, I'm looking to buy leads. I, I want to cold call people out here. He goes, who did you work for before? And I told him. And that night, I'm sitting there watching TV. I'm like, I hear the phone going off. Yeah. And Stu Fine, they threatening me. You motherfucker, really? next time I Stu see him, I'm going to fucking show you. Stu is the best. So listen, this fucking guy, I'm, I'm with Stu and a big guy named Andy Carp. He weighed 550 fucking pounds. He used to, forget about it. So we're, we're making calls. And I was good at it. One day I hooked into a guy named Paul Hicks. He was a fucking uh, stockbroker in Colorado, but Loveland, Colorado. But he was into all sorts of shit. He was fucking betting a lot of money. And out of nowhere, Stu says to me, tell him you're going, I'm 21, tell him you're 22, tell him you're going to Vegas and you're taking your five best customers. Everybody's giving you $60,000. You're going to turn it into $250,000. I said, I'm, not, I'm like, is this going to fucking work? He says, do it. I get Paul, listen, I'm going to Vegas, ba ba ba. I tell him the whole scam. I says, you can meet me out there. I'll turn the money around. I'll give you four or five times on your investment. Just, okay, I, my, my name was Johnny Rourke. I use Johnny Rourke. I use Frankie Nolan, Eddie Grant. He says, okay, Johnny, I'll, I'll be out there. Sorry, right, I'll make it right. So we go. 
We fly into Vegas. I'm with my buddy Mitch, who was a big cokehead. Clear the limousine. I'm waiting at the airport. Here comes, he looked like Richard Dreyfus. He's coming in. His pants were too long. His heels were hitting the fucking back of his suit. And he has a briefcase in his hand. He gets in the limousine. And we're going to Caesar's Palace. And uh, we're talking. We get in the room. I open the briefcase. And I'm counting the money. I'm looking for 60 grand. And he's talking to Mitch. And I go, I, I said, you know, Mitch is a uh, black belt in Kung Fu and Taekwondo, all that shit. And I just made it up, and Paul goes, oh, I'm a black belt as well. What form do you use? Mitch wasn't a black belt. He was. A, Mitch goes, oh, I don't want to talk about it. I, I, I killed a man uh, five years ago. It's very, uh, I can't talk about it. I said, Paul, I'm counting the money. You, you, you're short $3,800. Oh, I'm sorry, Johnny. He's pulling money out of his fucking top shirt pocket, his fucking pants, his underwear. Okay, good. I said, go home, relax. I got it from here. Naturally... All we did is get coke, get girls, fucking gamble. We lost sixty grand in two days, gone. Uh. So I got to I call Stu. I says, uh, you know, he says, call him back, get another twenty. I says, all right. So I called Paul. He says, hey Johnny, how did it go? I says, not not good. Oh really? I says, I need twenty thousand more. Well, Johnny, I said, Paul, I I, I got. The game, Yankees, Toronto, Blue Jays. I know exactly what's going on. We got an umpire on our side. Do me a fucking favor. He's calling balls and strikes. Don't be a fucking asshole. This isn't a gold mine. This is the game. Get the 20,000 West. Okay, Johnny. He sends it over. But at that point, I just took the 20 and left. I wasn't going to fuck around. So I told Stu we lost it, blah, blah, blah. I left. But the point is, I had money in my pocket, and we did so well that we had a TV show that was that was actually on 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 ESPN for a while. It was called Football Forecast, and it was four you know four of us from different sports agencies with a host, and we'd give out fucking our picks. We couldn't mention the spread, but we'd say, "I think the Giants should win by at least six tomorrow." Ba ba ba, and. People would see the show and call in, and the phones would fucking light the up. Oh the money God, was. Man. I got a guy named Carl Mozak, who was an owner of a half owner of the Charlotte Bobcats back then. He had irrigation systems in the Carolinas. The guy was filthy fucking rich. We called him the elephant. The guy would bet fifty, sixty, eighty thousand dollars a night, and I hooked him up with John Gotti's operation. That's how the whole me and Gotti thing happened because he his bookie died. And I couldn't afford to hit, to have him with no bookie. So I said, I can find a guy for you. So I called my cousin Albert, who was hooked up with working for John. I said, I need a guy. I got a guy here. He's, he's betting fucking big. He goes, do you vouch for him? Now, I didn't understand that term, vouch for him back then. I said, yeah, the guy's fucking loaded. I vouch for him. He says, AJ, you, you vouch for him. It's important. I says, Albert, I vouch for him. So we're gambling. The guy's winning. He's losing. He's paying. He's getting paid. And suddenly, after the third week, this is the kind of guy who had like a half a million dollars rolling on a fucking night in college basketball. He'd bet Creighton versus Drake, like the worst teams he'd bet. And long story short, he fell out. He was down like $48,000, and he had to pay. I says, I says, listen, Carl, you can't fuck around. This is not your bookie in Nebraska. This is a big fucking guy. I know, I know, Johnny, I'll pay. He sends $500, which is an insult to anybody that's running a house, let alone Gotti. It's Thanksgiving time. John Gotti calls my house Thanksgiving during dinner and says, hey, listen to me. He goes, listen to me. Your friend? No good. He says, this is 1985 now. He says, he's in Colorado I'm going to send you and Albert to Colorado not to learn how to ski, to get my fucking money. Do you understand me? I said, okay, okay. And he said the best line. He goes, in a business with no ethics, we got to have ethics. <laughs> That's what he said to me. I said, okay, okay. He hangs up. I said, Albert, what the fuck's going on? He said, AJ, get that fucking money. The guy, I could never find the guy again. Now, this is Thanksgiving. If you remember, December 14th, whatever it was, 85, Gotti and company wax Castellano in front of Spark Steakhouse. He becomes Godfather. And apparently everything changed in his life. He didn't care about the debt. He didn't care about that money that my guy owed him. And it went away. It went away. So I ended up 
knowing John because of that. He broke my balls because of that. John was a big gam. John was a big bad gambler. Bad God, gambler, he yeah. was the worst. He, he would get. He, he said, "I bet against two cockroaches running across the street." I don't give a fuck. I'm not, you know. Uh, but those. So I had money. So when I went to that party, I mean, Mickey was there. I was running around throwing dollars around. And long story short, uh, Mickey, we went to the party at Rex. The chick showed up. I told that gossip columnist. So I started going out and seeing shit. And in time, the woman who hired me got hired by the New York Daily News, and she took me with her. And she goes, how much money do you want to make? Mort Zuckerman bought the news, and he's bringing me over. He wants me to, I said, I want you. What do you want to make? I said, I don't know. I had no clue. I don't know. I said, uh, uh, 60, 70,000? She goes, done. No problem. I should ask for 100. So I came in at 60 or whatever the fuck, 65. And then back in the 90s, it was so different. I would get raises like every eight months. I would walk in. Our page was so good. We were breaking such big stories that I would walk in and she'd tell me, go ask for more money. Get more money. I'd say, really? She goes, go in there and get more money. And I walk in and say, I broke this story, that story, this story. Okay, I said, I think I should make 90 now. And I, I'd make 90. It, this went on for two years to the point where I was making, I was making a, you know, 200 and change as a gossip columnist with all my meals paid for, all my drinks paid <coughs> for, all my flights paid for. I was flying high. And um, I remember being a regular kid. In the city. I remember working in Manhattan in 84 and 85. And I would go out four nights a week. And I can't sit here because I was coked up and fucking coiluted up. I was pilled up. I didn't do coke back then. But I remember certain situations that if you if you would, and I know you, you were a slick dude. You also had five dudes helping you out. No, you no, had no. a guy at Aria. Yeah, of course. You know what I'm saying? Of you course. Had a, you had yeah, a guy at the to. garden. You have to. You had a guy at the Everywhere. black club. Of course. You, you had Soul a guy kitchen. at the strip club. Soul kitchen. You had a guy, and you had a guy Aria. in Jersey. Gay club. And whatever. Always. At Mezzaluna. Always. At the Mezzaluna. See, just to see who would show up. Of course. And the guy would call you and go, you're not going to believe who just walked yeah, in. of course. Brad Pitt with a blonde, with a wig on. And then. And there you go. That's how you work it. Scores was the big the big mecca back then. And I remember one thing. I still remember one of the craziest things. Things. Like, I remember going out one night and seeing Richard Gere. No big fucking deal. But the craziest night I ever went out was in 84. And I saw your boy. Mickey. No. What oh boy? I know you miss me. I know you miss, miss me. me. Oh. I know you coach boy George? I saw I know boy boy. George. Boy's I know heroin, jo- heroin out. Oh, yeah. Dancing with a wall. <laughs> and those days there was no fucking cell phones like yeah it was the best remember there was no cell phones nothing and you could walk into a club and see three people on a table drinking drinks forget about with it. a mirror with cocaine yeah right there right there I mean you could, uh, forget you it that would not have like a camera no guys walked in the club with guns they, they put it's the fucking gun fucking crazy forget it I used to see oh my god I would go to regular I was never a city night life I was a Jer- northern New Jersey guy Listen, if I could save a hundred bucks to snort an extra gram, <laughs> that's what I did. I'm gonna go to the city yeah, and snort no, the same you. fucking gram yeah. to pay boom, no, boom, boom, yeah. boom in your fucking ear. And the toll. The, Some and nights I go over to uh, the rooftop. Some nights I go over to area, you know. And then I got a job at the Sheridan on 52nd and 7th. And you get out at one, so you're already out at one. You stole a yardstick. Yeah, of course. You made two yardsticks. You're in the middle of the city at 1 a.m. in 1985. That money's gone. That money is gone. Gone. You catch a fucking, you get a cab downtown, you already got a package on you. You would just walk into a bar and there's fucking things going on. But how great was, how great was that? The fact that you, to this day, when I go to New York and I land and I'm in Manhattan, especially downtown, I remember today, I had a Mercedes 500 SL. I fucking, I was the, okay, I was the man because of my job. And I had a, I had a fucking super. Well, you're a gossip cutter, so everybody's got to be nice oh, to you. Oh, yeah. yeah all yeah, the no, restaurants bought, picked up your check. Yeah, I didn't pay a fucking dime. Nothing. You were the Lawrence every, Taylor no, without know, even knowing. I, no, I, listen, no. I took Lawrence's girl. I, I remember taking Randall Cunningham's wife to China Club and fucking Lawrence Taylor going, 
you the fucking man, nigga. Because this is like, you know, when Randall Cunningham was the man and Lawrence Taylor was the... I was dating downtown Julie Brown when Lawrence Taylor was kind of dating her, wanting to get in there. Oh, it was... Th- th- that The scene back then was... The Palladium, right? Was the Palladium, day. Limelight. Uh, it, 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 there was so many places to go and be seen. So I was plugged into all of it, all of it. And everybody would call me. And when you're a gossip columnist, there are publicists, and they're all fucking cute. They're all hot. They all wear black clothes, and they all they all want their clients in the paper, and they all want their they represent a shoe store on West Broadway. They went. And I would just sit there. I would, I would go to Spy Bar, which was on Green Street, which was the hottest fucking spot in the 90s. And I had a, I had a buddy named Johnny Boy Calvani, who is uh, 67 maybe, big pothead. And we wrote, he had an old Mercedes. I had a new one. We'd drive around, and they would move the fucking cones. We'd park in front of the club, which is... That those little things like that mean so much. When you can just roll up to the club and they just let you park in front of the club and you toss the keys to the guy, and he would say, "I don't care what you do the rest of your life. When you get older, you're gonna remember they fucking moved the cones for us on West Broadway." And you said earlier, you he was Lee was doing a bong. You said this is the shit that killed Castro. Johnny would say this is the shit that killed Bruce Lee. That was his line. And Johnny would say we'd sit at the piano at Spy Bar, which is like about five feet above the crowd and Johnny would say to me you know what he goes if you were up in space and you look down on earth and you look down on America and in America you look down in New York City and in New York City you look down in Greenwich Village and in Greenwich Village you went Spring Street and Spring Street you found Spy Bar and in Spy Bar you found the fucking piano You'd find us, buddy. He'd say, we're the fucking kings of the world. And back then, as stupid as it sounds, that was true. To be at the piano at Spy Bar in the 90s with everybody running around, fucking insane. We were kings, kings of the city. Well, after that talk we just had, what did the people around you think when you said you were going to be a gossip columnist? They, it's a very powerful position, and you have people around town. And the reason why my podcast kind of took off the last few, the last seven, eight weeks, is because I was a really good friend, and I still am, of Harvey Weinstein's. And I am. I love the guy. I love the guy, and I talk to him all the time. I talk to him all the time. And he was mad at me that I, I, I was in the New York Times article, and there's a picture of me. And but the point is. It was all it, it, that, that free Harvey, all right? No, nah, well, free listen, Harvey. no, no, listen. Jesus that, Christ! I, no, well, not, 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 free not, not free Harvey. <laughs> I do not not, no, 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 not free Harvey. I'm just saying, I love Harvey. He did some bad shit, and we'll see what he's guilty of. However, that motherfucker put out the best fucking movies you could think of, and. I know that things sound awful, and I, I don't want to disagree with the girls who said what happened happened. I don't think I don't think a lot of girls lie, but I will say this: for every girl who got molested or raped, I think there are five others who went up to that fucking hotel room and let him wear the robe and let him jerk off. That's Hollywood, but I'm not taking away from the girls who got no no no, no. I'm not because I believe them. No. I just loved that. I wasn't going to bring Harvey up. Ha- that's- Harvey, I got a friend. Listen, I got a friend Harvey. <laughs> I didn't listen. Oh, I talked to him. I, I got I talked a friend. To him. He fucking- got so mad. He got so mad at me. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You know, remember that episode? Put it on Lee. What? Just put on YouTube. Okay. The honeymoon is Harvey. Oh, the Harvey honeymoon the is Harvey. episode. I got a, and Harvey said. Harvey, listen, I got a friend. <laughs> Go ahead. Hey, my friend Harvey's even bigger than me. Remember that guy? I got a friend Shirley who's bigger than you. That is the <laughs> exactly. line of the fucking year. That was great. I before I came here, I left to see what episode was on tonight. Oh, tonight's a classic. Tonight at eleven o'clock on Channel Twenty. Channel Twenty, Sunday. right? I know. Tonight's the one where he throws his wife out and he makes a record all emotional but he has to make the third record finally is when he does a sweet one <laughs> but Norton sends her the wrong record 
the one that he's really angry, and he calls his wife a big mouth and all this. Oh. It's a classic episode, but I got it on tape, so I don't give a Frenchman's fuck. <laughs> it's, it's, that's the one right there. Jesus, yeah, they got it, the bomber. Ralph meets Harvey. Harvey was a great actor. This motherfucker was big. This, oh, uh, fuck. Here we go. Right there is what you tell him. Here we go. My ha and Harvey said. I'm going in and tell my friend Harvey. <laughs> Harvey. <laughs> oh, Harvey. <laughs> You're going to tell your friend Harvey. <laughs> Harvey. He's going to tell Harvey. That's a nice name. I like that. That's a nice name. That's Harvey. a nice name. Harvey. I don't care if you tell Harvey. Go ahead and tell him. He's got me mighty scared. I'm shaking the dust. You better be careful. My friend is even bigger than me. <laughs> Your friend Harvey is bigger than you? I have a friend Shirley that's bigger than you. <laughs> you keep watching. Very lucky. Look like you leave. Very lucky. No, looks like you do. Like Watch his voice. Watch it's how Harvey talks. Hobby. Watch how he talks. I told you, you're not going to get the table. Now go away. Come on, Norton, will you? And you beat it too, Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, Ralph, he's even bigger than your friend Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> I got an idea those bookends are going to be a little lopsided. <laughs> what are you talking about, bookends? Uh, he said he was going to twist me and you into bookends. Oh, he did, huh? So you're going to twist me and him into bookends. <laughs> that's right, that's right. He's going to twist you and him into bookends. you got nothing to worry about, Ralph. You're in the right. Nobody can push you around. Why don't you shut That's not all he said. He made fun of your name. He said Harvey was a funny name. Oh, he did, huh? Harvey's a lovely name. So Harvey's a funny name. <laughs> You're a real wise guy, huh? I think I his forehead like to be so guys. straight. You know what I might do to you? I might punch you right in the mouth. Wait, now, wait, wait, whoa, wait, wait. Whoa, wait. Whoa, whoa. You can't talk to us that way. You keep out of this. <laughs> yeah, stay what out are you of yelling it. at me for? <laughs> I wasn't the one that <laughs> pushed you into a pretzel. He did. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna twist me into a pretzel. Huh? I don't even like pretzels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's She's gonna twist me into a pretzel. <laughs> All right, wise guy. I'll give you a chance. Come on, step outside. Well, Ralph, I'll hold your coat. All right, I'll shoot. <laughs> Come on, wise guy, step outside and twist me into a pretzel. Fucking it. That is one of the classic. Benson Hurst, that's my, I, that I grew up in Benson Hurst. That's my hometown. Episodes. And then at the end, they set him up. Yeah. He comes in, he, they make a guy bigger than him show up, and he knocks him out. Oh, my God. And the guy says, he didn't, my friend didn't show up. Gleason. He couldn't make it tonight. Gleason is. And that was all one take, Lee. Really? That was live. That shot live. Oh, shit, dog. that's right. That's a live show. That shot live. Fuck saying that live. That shot fucking live, dog. Right that live. I went throw up last night. It's funny I because, I, you know, so we were bad. both in the same age for a while. We went to a few meetings. <laughs> we were going to do a show for a minute. And remember? then we both disappeared. We yeah. both fired them. And then I didn't see you around. And you know how this town is. People go home and stuff like that, whatever. Yeah. And I was really, really happy to see you in Rocky Six. Balboa, you yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. You did a great job. And then, like, you know when you don't see somebody and then you see him fucking ten times in two weeks? Right, right, time? right. Then a few weeks later, it was some, maybe an episode, they, they do something What'd on Tuesday say? nights on one of those channels and it was you walking huh? six, eight feet from John Gotti about the interview. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. tape, old tapes, yeah. old tapes. Yeah. And it was you interviewing him at one point, and then the other interview was the uh, Irish guy. John Miller was there. Miller. Was yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got to be real close with him. I got to be close with him because uh, when I worked at Newsday, I got close with John, and, you know, he knew me from the whole fucking gambling thing. And I remember I went to see him downtown when he was on trial. I went to the trial, uh... And uh, that was a trip. Anthony Quinn went to the trial. Mickey Rourke went to the trial. A lot of a lot of a lot of actors go to the trials. And I remember uh, there was one moment where uh, his life hung in the balance. It was going to be 
you're going to go to jail forever or whatever. And across from the court, downtown of Manhattan, there's a restaurant on Mott Street called uh, Jim Bones. I think it's still there. It's a great fucking joint. Real fucking old school phone booth in a restaurant. Like, forget it. Like, And uh, I followed them to the restaurant and I sat down with them. Jerry Shargell, Bruce Cutler, Sammy the Bull. But at one point, Sammy the Bull, I, he was looking me up and down and he said to John, like, what the fuck is this guy doing? What, what, what was this kid? And John said, uh, he's all right. And Sammy said, yeah, but he's with the press. And he said, yeah, but he's more he's more all right than them. <laughs> I love that saying. So let me sit down. And uh, he, he was good to me. He was good to me. And I, his daughter's been good to me. She came to my book party. I don't know. It's one of, you know, there are things in life that happen that you kind of get kissed by an angel. Like, why through, through Stu Finer and the gambling thing... I would meet John Gotti and he would end up liking me and that would end up honestly making people think something about me like AJ's, you know, AJ's around the mob, that kind of, and it worked. And then when I got into the ni- mid 90s and I started running around, uh, I, I, it was a nightclub called Rouge in the Upper East Side, which was all Genovese. And scores, the strip club was Genovese and Gambino, and but yet my name, even though I was a gossip columnist, my name they under they knew it, they accepted it, and they didn't fuck around with me. Now, how did Goomba and Johnny get in trouble? Ah, uh, you know, Goomba and Johnny, he was around. Was he was a the doorman. The, yeah, he was in the down. scores crew. They were uh, shaking down the girls. Yeah, yeah. My my roommate Chico was uh, was involved in all that, and. Between me and you, Goomba Johnny, he, he, he was working on fucking borrowed time. There's nothing he did that made him fucking strong or tough or important. Kind of He's, a lazy name, too. Well, yeah, no, 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 no. It's an it's a, it's a expression of respect, Goomba you're, Johnny. You're Goomba working on a strip club shaking down the girls. They all did. The, 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 strippers, the strippers, they fucking paid out up front. They used to pay out to everybody. They got shook down. Everybody shook people down. Uh, it, it was a, it was a, it was like a pyramid. Everybody got shook down money, down to the security guards, to the fucking valet guy. Everybody got shook down. Everybody. And when the mobsters walked in, Joe Watts, Joe the German, all these mobsters, Angelo Bruno, all these mobsters would walk in and they'd say, and you you mentioned this earlier about people paying people's rent, like you know Eddie Murphy. When 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 mafiosa come to New York City clubs. They'd approach the head of security, who was my roommate, Chico, who was no longer, he, he died. But they'd say, Chico, how many guys are working tonight in security? And Chico would say, ah, you know, six. All right, here. And they'd fucking, and they'd fucking just peel off fucking hundreds. they say, here, take care of the guy. Here's fucking, here's $2,800. Take care of everybody. And Chico would do, you get three, you get four, you get two, you get five, that, and every and my ex girlfriend was a bartender, and I'd see the bartenders. All the girls were hot bartenders. I'd see their faces when the mafiosi would walk in. They knew rent is covered this month. If Joe Watts and 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 Vinnie Gorgeous walked in, Angelo Bruno, you name it, they knew. Okay, we're well, cool. If a if a bartender walked the scotch and soda to Joe Watts, she got two fifty. You know, if he came in twice that week, she got a five hundred that week. Those guys, they kept the city running. They kept it oiled. You know, more than celebrities. They were just, they fucking took care of everybody. They were great. They were great. And and because I vouched for Chico, I ended up being on the bad side of them because Chico at one point started collecting money from my buddy who was a pot dealer who he had outstanding debts. And Chico said, I'll get you, I'll get your money. Because one of the big Genovese guys, Ralphie Coppola, who's now dead, he liked us and he said, listen, you're around me now. It was like Donnie Brasco. You're around me. Don't worry, man. No one, no one can touch you. Anybody bothers you, you say, I'm with Ralphie. Okay. When you hear that, you think you won the... You did. In essence, you won the fucking lottery. You could do whatever the fuck you want. Someone bothers you, whoa, 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 whoa. You got to talk to Ralphie. And it works. So Chico was asking for money from an old guy who had a fucking pot debt. He didn't want to pay. He goes, listen, I'm with Ralphie. 
Unfortunately, that guy's father grew up with Ralphie, and he told his father, and the father called Ralphie and said, why is this kid using your name for a fucking marijuana debt? So one night, Ralphie calls and says, why don't you and Chico come up to Gino's on 3rd Avenue and have a fucking great meal. We'll be out all night. We'll get to drink some fucking grappa. It's going to be great. All right. We all go to Gino's. It's fucking fat snowing in Manhattan. Fucking great. Best meal. He says, AJ, why don't you go do your thing? Me and Chico are going to hang out. Okay. So about an hour later, I get a phone call. And Chico is just destroyed in the street. They beat the fuck out of him. Well, when I left, they walked him out. They had a nice meal, cigars, grappa. And they just punched the fuck out of him. They had, they, I mean, he had to have a screen put in his stomach because his intestines were coming out. So they beat the shit out of him. And I vouched for Chico. There's that word again, vouched. So I called one of my guys who's an old-time mobster, and I said, what do I do now? I vouched for Chico. I got to go back to the club. He said, don't change anything you do. Go to the club, go to the bar, order your espresso with Sambuca. And I did. And when I went there, the same guys who would see me and hug me and go crazy, hey, Joe, hey, what's going on? I walked in. The fucking stares they gave me, they didn't say nothing. They looked at me with fucking eyes like daggers. And I sat there at the bar and I drank my espresso. And I left and I was ready to get jumped on Park Avenue. I knew I was going to get jumped, killed, knifed, whatever. Nothing happened. Those days are awful. As much fun as you have with the guys, you know, wiping out a bar in Westchester County, taking, cleaning out their liquor, whatever the fuck, grabbing girls. And when you're on their bad side, oh my God, is that the fucking scariest thing in the world. Horrifying. Anyhow, the guys who were after me were all dead. They were all dead. I mean, this is 20 years later. It's, it's, a, it's a horrible lifestyle, but they're all gone. When I lived in Boston, I lived in the... <clears throat> in the North End for a couple of years. North End is tough. And yeah, and the, and the rumor was that there were a couple people on my street that were actually connected. And I, I didn't know if how much of it was true. Is there actually people there? North End? Sure, North End, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Boston. Well, how about Whitey Bulger, for one? Well, yeah, well he was here. Yeah, I know. Let me ask but, you this. Uh, Are you going to try to get Gravano on your podcast? I, 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 you know, that'd be great. I don't know how much he's talking. Yeah, I would love to. I'd try, sure. <coughs> I don't know how much he wants to uh, how much he wants to talk about it, but uh, you know, Sam be ratted. I don't, you know, people rat. I, I I can't even. It ain't the old days, and this is we're going back twenty years. When he ratted, it was really not what people did, not what tough guys did. But who's the joke on? Everybody's dead. Sammy went to Arizona. He did his time. By the way. He had an ecstasy ring that was bringing in seven hundred and fifty thousand fucking dollars a month when he was in Arizona. That's how he got pinched. He did his time. He's out now. He'll probably get a f- not probably. I know he's going to get a reality show. I know for a fact who's going to fucking be the showrunner. I made a joke on it on my podcast. It's going to run in a couple of, in about six seven days. That you know, suddenly this guy's going to get more work than me, Sammy the Bull. They're going to hire him for more shows than me. He'll probably be hosting a show that I would have hosted, but now Sammy the Bull's going to get it. That's the way Hollywood is. What am I going to do? You know, everybody rats. It ain't the old days. The, 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 new, the, new guys, the new guys rat. The new guys want their screenplays to be made into movies. It's a very different mafia. It's very different. Don't you think? You had a very interesting life, man. Mm-hmm. From journalist to... Covering all type of shit. Like I said, one time I watched one of your shows when you were at the magician's house. Oh, yeah. Not Houdini, somebody. That was fucking crazy on Laurel Canyon. Well, David Blaine was a buddy, but it wasn't his no, house. No, 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 Somebody was dead. No, you we had an investigative a, somebody. Uh, yeah. Well, I went, that's when A&E was kicking. I liked A&E a lot then. No, A&E. I was on E. Just you, E. You, oh, you were on E. He was, right. he was hot, though, but he was he hot. He was hot. He yeah, was yeah, yeah, yeah. True Hollywood Stories, Mysteries and Scandals, Howard Stern. He was, he was, uh, he was hot. He was That's hot. Right. Howard Stern was on E. That's right. Holy yeah, shit. Yeah, I used to I used to follow. I was on after Howard. I was on before Howard, 
And then I had a talk show after Howard. It was only on for four weeks. It was a fucking... Um, it would have been good, but they pulled the plug because they were fucking nervous. But uh, those... E was great. E was... E was, uh, e was great back then. Uh, they let me do what I wanted to do. They said, what else do you want to do? I said, I want a talk show. Okay. I grabbed a fucking loft in Manhattan. I, I found a place downtown... Uh, with a Chinese doorman, with an elevator that went upstairs. I booked the guests. I booked Dan Rather, Al Sharpton, fucking supermodels. It was great, but it lasted only four weeks. And the last week, th th check this out. This is Hollywood. George Hamilton came on. Um, I said, if you let me have this show, trust me, people are going to show up because it's going to be a spot to go before you go out. My, my, my barmaid's were hot Brazilians. I had alcohol in the audience. No one had alcohol yet. This is before Jimmy Kimmel. No one had alcohol. The, it was, the fucking crowd was great. I had music acts. Everybody smoked weed. Like, it was a loft. So people smoked weed before they came on. Very loosey-goosey. And um, for the fifth show, I'm ready. I'm at the, I'm staying in the hotel in the Upper West Side. I'm about to go downtown to shoot. And the girl I was dating was my little assistant, and she gets a phone call. Oh, okay, really? Oh, oh, I'll I'll put him on. Oh, what's up? I had a book. I had, I my book came out was in the window of bookstores. I had a fucking TV show. I had a talk show, and I hear, listen, we're not gonna. The show's not gonna go tonight. So what do you mean? I had Chris Rock was a guest. I had like five great guests. They they pulled the plug as I'm going down. To, hold, to to do the show. Live, not live, but tape. But I was going down. So they let the stars fly in, and they pulled the plug, and I was out of my fucking mind. That's the kind of shit that happens in Hollywood. I was literally dressed and ready to go on, and they pulled the fucking plug. It's the worst. And, it, and, and Joey, it took me eight fucking years. There was a lesbian boss at E! named Mindy Herman who fucking loved me and every article and the reporter and variety was AJ's the best and she pulled the plug and it killed me for eight years and one night I get a fucking Facebook message from Mindy Herman I go what the fuck is this I take I says I accept she says I want to apologize it's not you it was me I'm, I'm nervous about talk shows you were great I'm so sorry I said, do you know what that my life has been like for the last eight years? How fucking miserable I've been? How, you know, like that would have been my ticket. I was going back to New York to host a talk show, which is something I always wanted to do. And this cunt just decided, nah, I don't want to, I don't want to do it. Killed me. It destroyed me. But eight years, I was miserable for eight fucking years. That's the business, bro. I'm happy you got over it, AJ. Bro. Yeah, I'm over it now. And now you're doing I'm movies. I'm here with fucking Joey Coco. What you're are you fucking close me? by. You have your children. Yeah. You look good. Well, and that's, that, that, that's the most important thing. I mean, listen, it's like fucking Mick Jagger said. You can't get what you want. You can't always get what you want. But you get what you need. We put a lot of the fucking I things. think What's you're right. What's your podcast, Tarzan? Fame is a bitch. And when, when does it come down? Every... every Every Wednesday and Friday are new episodes, and you'll like it because lately I've been, the last six, seven weeks, I've been outing every pervert, every fucking pedophile in Hollywood. I'm very close to the Harvey Weinstein situation, so I got the goods on everybody. So you got in trouble for what, for Harvey Weinstein? I didn't get in trouble. I, uh, Harvey gave it. me a book deal 20 years ago. Harvey's been my man, and Harvey asked me for help a year ago in December. He texted, he called me and said, come to the peninsula, I need your help. This is way before anything came out. I went to the peninsula, I said, what's up? He said, look, they're doing a bad article on me. New York Magazine's going to kill me. I said, okay, what do you want to do? He says, why don't you write, let's make believe, let's, why don't you be an author and you're going to write a bad book about me. I'll give you people to call, and if you call them and they tell you bad shit about me, I'll know where the bad stories are coming from. I said, okay. He said, I'll give you 20000 a month. This is going to be fine. I said, all right. So a week goes by. He didn't call. Two weeks, no call. I said, boss, what's up? He said, hang tight. And I never heard back. But between me and you, I said, I can't write a bad book about Harvey. People know I'm his friend. They know he it doesn't work. 
But thank God, because he didn't say the stories are surrounding him were about rape and chicks getting molested. He just said there's a bad article coming out. And I'm the guy 13 years ago who protected him when he was cheating on his wife and having an affair, and I buried that story for for months and months and months um, because he needed the help because Disney and Miramax were doing a big business endeavor. Um, so I'm close to him, uh, but I never knew... I don't. I never knew this side of him. Never. I figured a guy like him, he's a movie mogul. They get laid. Starlets come to them. They fuck him. I understand. I, Howard Hughes, Daryl Zanuck. <coughs> you name the mogul. You know, come on. It's Hollywood. But I never in, my, in a million years ever thought fucking pushing indoors, raping chicks. I mean, no, never. So him and I talked a couple of weeks ago. And he said, you talk to the New York Times? I said, yeah. He says, why would you do that? I said, because the story they came to me at was wrong. They had it wrong. They had it that I suggested I write a book about you. I said, that's not true. He says, bullshit. I said, no, Harvey. I said, I got a wife and family. I got a, I got a fucking career. I'm not gonna, I, 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 can't, I can't go down like that. It was wrong. So I cooperated and I told the kid what was right. He says, AJ, you and I, we're guys that don't talk. I said, I understand, but it was it was full of errors, and I had to correct that. He said, okay, what else did you say? So I told him what I said, and I said, not for nothing, Harvey. He said, why are you worried about me? Do you know what people are saying about you? He says, no, I don't. Tell me. I said, you don't know what they're saying? I said, they're calling you the biggest fucking monster in the last hundred years. He said, AJ... Everything you hear was consensual. And we went down girl by girl. I'm not going to bore you with the details. But at the end of the phone call, he said, listen, you heard Clooney, you heard Damon, you heard these guys talk about me, Affleck. He said, if I, if I told everybody what I know about this town, it would fall to its fucking knees and stop. I said, I'm sure you're right, bro. He said, okay, amigo, I'll see, you. I'll see you down the road. I said, Harvey, I got two pictures on my wall in my office, you and John Gotti. He said, that's some fucking company you keep. I said, yeah. So I'm not betting against him. I'm sure he's guilty, but I'm not betting against him coming back. I won't. I, I, I just think that a guy like him, if he had the script of Pulp Fiction if he had the script to the next Pulp Fiction now, I'm telling you right now, there'd be a line up and down the 405 with people who want the accolades, the money, and the fame to work with them. Even with the fucking fires raging on each side of the highway. That's why this it's fucking Satan town. Satan lives here, brother. What's that? Satan lives here part time. No kidding. Part-time. No kidding. In the beginning of the Exodus, the archaeologists, they see him, he finds a little devil. Yeah, there's a Satan. He lives here in Hollywood, and the other part, he's like a snowbird. <laughs> Satan's a fucking <laughs> snowbird. Great to have you on, my brother. I'm happy you. I love you, buddy. Out. You too. Those are some great fucking stories. Thank man. you, Pally. God bless you, man. Lee, how you doing, brother? I'm doing great, buddy. I didn't hear Lee tonight. No, he didn't say Normally he, didn't he talks. Say it's Hanukkah. Maybe it's a double you know, bomb. It's here. Hanukkah. I don't know. He's right, trying right. to rest. Okay, let's He's see. resting. You know? No, no. It was great stories tonight. Double bomb hit. I could tell by your eyes you shot. Oh, no. What, right, about, what about the 1,000 milligrams of THC we eat? I didn't know about that. Yeah. We what down. about that enema you gave him earlier? I didn't know oh, about yeah, that. No, that, that, that was <laughs> tremendous. <laughs> so, Lee, you downloaded the Anchor app. I did. That was great. Talk to me. Okay. <clears throat> it's a very cool app. It's, it's, you put in what you're interested in and what you want to hear, like the latest news stories, sports. Uh, I'm sure they have stuff about gossip. Let me just take a drink of water. So what you got to do, Lee? But they have these amazing people who are doing like short five minute long podcasts that they upload straight from their phone. And it's great. You can call in to these separate different channels and talk directly to the people who are doing the shows. It's really interesting. And there's so much content. I had a really good time looking at it this afternoon. 
Well, this episode of the church is brought to you by Anchor. If you ever wanted to make a podcast like this one, but thought the process would be expensive and horrible, listen, no need to worry. Anchor is the quickest and easiest way to make downloads, distribute your own podcast, period. Just upload the app, record your phone, record with your phone, and publish. Best of all, it's completely free. Check it out and make your own podcast at anchor.fm slash church. That's anchor.fm slash church. Listen, for months you've been sitting there thinking about doing that podcast. Uh You're at home going, how do I start a podcast? How do I start a podcast? How do I start a podcast? This is your opportunity right here. Download the app. It's that easy. All right? You want to make a podcast like this one? And I know this is scary to everybody. You think there's going to be a bunch of computers and wires and whatnot? Boom. (laughs) Just download the app, record with your phone, and publish the thing. It's that easy. And best of all, like I said before, it's completely free. So check it out and make your own podcast. You ready? At anchor.fm. Again, anchor.fm slash church. That's anchor.fm slash church. Now, like I said before, it's the important time of the year. I know you're writing a letter to Santa Claus, and you're telling him he still owes you money. And he, But the second thing on the list is that you want a clean fucking butt cheek. You got <laughs> excess pine cones having from your bowels of holly <laughs> and some fudgy pudding <laughs> smear of mud your muffler. You don't need this. It's the holidays. You want to start 2018 with a clean asshole. You know what you need? You need a tushy bidet. It'll clean your ass better than any toilet paper on the fucking market. It uses clean water to spray your butt fucking minty fresh without the fucking Irish spring. You follow what I'm saying to you? And it's portable. You put it right on your fucking bathroom, and there you are. I'm one of those guys, I wash my ass, then I take a shower, you know what I'm saying? To double check the work. No more skid marks, no more sugar burned ferries hanging. You ever go to you ever go to wipe your ass and there's old toilet paper there oh, for the night before, Dingleberry. and it's rolled up like a fucking skinny joint, <laughs> like joint. a fucking joint with no weed. <laughs> Almost in like it. a spitball. Yeah, they're fucking spitball. disgusting. So listen, oh. they all start at sixty nine dollars, and they come in beautiful different colors, and I'm sure. Santa can afford one of those. So stop wiping that fucking nasty fucking muffler and start living like a doctor with Tushy. And they come in different colors. Beautiful. That's hellotushy.com. Use code CHURCH, C-H-U-R-C-H, for 10% off your order. Listen to me. Why give that uncle the same fucking boring gift when you can give that motherfucker a bidet and know he's going to pre Listen, you give a 64-year-old uncle a bidet who his wife died. Who's better than you? He's going to sit there all day whacking that fucking dick like Harvey with hot water hitting his asshole. You know what I'm saying? Hot water pop job. Oh, shit. HelloTushy.com. Use code CHURCH for 10% off your order. Again, I want you to go with anchor.fm slash church. That's anchor.fm slash church and Tushy. <coughs> also, a shout out to Fujisports.com. You're going to make a commitment. You're going to join jiu-jitsu. You want a bigger fucking gi, A5, A6. Go to Fuji and get the separito. You're not going to fucking deny. You're not going to fucking be sorry. Press fucking church and get 15% off. You know how we do it tonight. Thank you, AJ Benz. Thank you, brother. I My love you, man. fucking number one Christ killer. Uh, come on. Lee Syatt. Let's kill him with some fucking music. Lee, come kill on. Him. Take me out, motherfucker. Come on, Take man. him out, Lee. <laughs>